In today's video, we are going over an evidence-based guide to cervical radiculopathy. Let's do it. This is part two in our series on cervical radiculopathy. If you missed the first part, then I'll leave a link in the show notes. You can listen to that and then get back to this one. So what is the mechanism of injury for cervical radiculopathy? Well, we already just went over it. You can either have a herniation of the intervertebral disc. Generally speaking, this is going to be a posterior lateral herniation. It could also be disc degeneration causing decreased neuroforaminal height, right? So if I have the disc height shrinking, 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 the intervertebral foramen will also get smaller with that decrease in disc height. And lastly, cervical spondylosis is basically osteoarthritis around the intervertebral foramen, which can also crowd that nerve. And one thing I definitely want to point out, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that you can have a lot of these degenerative changes with no symptoms whatsoever, okay? And one of the reasons why potentially is because we have a decent amount of space in that intervertebral foramen. And as things degenerate over the course of time, it may crowd the nerve a little bit, but the nerve still has plenty of space and doesn't necessarily lead to symptoms over the course of time. The prevalence of osteoarthritis in the spine, as well as disc herniations as we age is pretty dang high. And just because we have these findings doesn't mean that you're going to be destined for pain. These are normal changes. There are three main types of disc herniations that can lead to cervical radiculopathy. The first one is intraforaminal, and this makes total sense. If you have a herniation right in that space where the nerve lives, obviously that can create some symptoms. These herniations lead to predominantly sensory radicular symptoms, and they are the most common, right? So if you have cervical radiculopathy from a disc herniation, this is going to be the most common presentation. You can also have a posterior lateral disc herniation, which you just mentioned. That's the next most common, and it generally results in weakness and potentially muscle atrophy, right? So if you're losing a lot of strength, it means the muscles are affected. If we're not getting good transmission from the nerves, to the muscles, they may shrink over the course of time. And when you're doing your clinical examination, you may find some weakness. You might also find the muscles a little bit smaller left to right. Lastly, you can have midline herniations, and these are usually more rare. They tend to directly compress the spinal cord and result in symptoms of myelopathy. Okay. So a more serious condition. And this leads to upper extremity numbness, weakness, gait disturbances, ataxia, and urinary incontinence. So basically when you have a patient come through the door, you want to ask for these symptoms. If they have something like myelopathy present, the treatment is going to be different than cervical radiculopathy, right? And now I've got a free guide for you today. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet to cervical radiculopathy. We go over all the fundamental basics for diagnosis and treatment of cervical radiculopathy. It's an eight page PDF, and I'll take you from a novice to an expert extremely quickly. I'm gonna leave a link in the description so you can go ahead and download that right now and get learning. And lastly, this cheat sheet was specifically made for the lesson today. So I have all of the bullet points in this presentation included in the cheat sheet. And this is really nice. So if you download it, you can follow along with today's lesson. And the other piece is that a couple months from now, if you're like, ah, oh, man, I kind of forgot what Dan said about cervical radiculopathy. You have a new patient coming in tomorrow and you want to make sure you do a good job. You can just take a look at the cheat sheet, reference it and just nail your examination. So how common are disc herniations in the cervical spine? Well, I thought this was pretty interesting information, but Disc herniations in the cervical spine are much less common than disc herniations in the lumbar spine. So disc herniations in the lumbar spine are going to account for the majority of lumbar radiculopathy, but in the cervical spine, they only account for about 22% of all cervical radiculopathy cases, right? So much less common for folks to have disc herniations in the neck causing radicular symptoms compared to the lumbar spine. Now we can also have some compression of the nerve leading to symptoms. And previously I said that just compression alone of the nerve isn't enough to create pain. So in studies where they go and compress a nerve within your body and see if that creates pain, it tends not to. So what the heck is going on in these patients that don't have a disc herniation, but they have compression and that leads to pain, radicular pain, right? Well, if you compress a nerve for long enough, that can lead to localized ischemia and nerve damage. So essentially the nerve is not getting oxygen and that can kill off portions of the nerve. But this compression can also trigger a pro-inflammatory cascade mediated by tumor necrosis factor, interleukin factor six, and matrix metalloproteinases. 
And this cascade leads to further sensitization and increased pain in the nerve, right? So if you compress the nerve, it doesn't create pain right away, but over the course of time, it creates a cascade of inflammation, which can create pain. And lastly, we can very easily get chemical irritation on the nerve. If you do have that disc herniation where the inside contents leak outside, if the exits are now in contact with that nerve root, that can create inflammation directly and create your radicular pain in your cervical radiculopathy patients. Tongue twister. I know we went over this, but cervical spondylosis can also be one of the reasons why we end up with cervical radiculopathy. So if we have these degenerative changes from aging, and that's going to be decreased disc height, as well as foraminal narrowing, this is going to increase loads to the vertebral body and the intervertebral joints of Lushka. Like I said, the onco-vertebral joints leading to osteophyte formation and bony hypertrophy. Hypertrophy of the onco-vertebral and facet joints can cause foraminal stenosis and cervical radiculopathy. So again, degenerative changes can also lead to cervical radiculopathy over the course of time. This is actually much more common than disc herniations. And lastly, cervical radiculopathy can also happen for a variety of other reasons. It's important to keep your eye out for. So it could be a tumor, could be trauma from, let's say, a whiplash injury, a car accident, maybe a fall, synovial cysts, meningeal cysts, dural arterial venous fistulae, and tortuous vertebral arteries. So... When you have your patient comes through the door, you're going to rule out medical red flags. And if they have no medical red flags, you initiate treatment. And over the course of time, if they're not improving, you send them back to the physician and they may order some imaging and find some of these things. Okay. So it is important that you're trying to rule out red flags before treating these. If you're not making progress over the course of time, you can send back to the doc. They can do some imaging and figure out if there's something going on that we're missing. Another leading cause of cervical radiculopathy is not hitting the like button or subscribing to the channel, both of which are very common and can lead to a lack of knowledge over the course of time, and you could potentially kill your patients. I'm just kidding, but please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Next is talk a little bit about history and presentation. So your patient comes through the door. Maybe they have cervical radiculopathy. You basically got some information on the intake form. Not exactly sure what they're dealing with. In terms of what these folks tend to present with, the most common symptom is going to be arm pain, okay? And that's interesting because when folks have arm pain, your first thought is usually maybe there's a shoulder issue, right? Not necessarily neck. So the majority of folks that come with cervical radiculopathy, 97 to 99% of those folks typically have arm pain, right? Around 85 to 91% of these patients tend to have a sensory deficit, so dermatomal changes, right? Next, around 71 to 84% of these folks tend to have reflex deficits, and in certain nerve roots, we can measure this. Again, not all of them, potentially. Around 56 to 80% of these folks tend to have neck pain. So very interesting, right? Um, you may have some patients that have zero neck pain whatsoever and a bunch of arm pain, right? That tends to happen. Uh, around half to 80% of folks are going to have neck pain with the arm pain. But the most common symptom is not neck pain, it's, it's going to be shoulder and arm pain, right? So keep that in mind. Around 64 to 70% of these folks tend to have a motor deficit, so myotomal weakness. 37 to 52% of these folks have periscapular pain or pain around the shoulder blade. Around 18% of these folks tend to have anterior chest pain. Can be pretty scary, right? You may want to try to rule out something like a heart attack before treating these folks, right? But keep in mind, cervical radicular pain can lead to chest pain in some folks. And lastly, around 10% of these folks present with headaches, right? So generally speaking, when people are presenting with headaches, my first thought is something like a cervicogenic headache, right? However, this really could be of neural origin and helping these folks with their neural based pain may help them with their headaches too. So I'm sure you guys know that I'm a huge fan of physical therapy. Unfortunately, a big chunk of physical therapists don't feel like they're paid enough for their level of education. According to the American Physical Therapy Association, the average physical therapist is graduating with $150,000 in debt. That's why I feel very strongly that physical therapists should have some additional ways to bolster their income. I am a really big fan of physical therapists writing strength and fitness training programs for their patients after discharge, as well as continuing with cash-based physical therapy after insurance has run out. However, once you start doing this, this is going to come with some technical issues. So how are my clients going to schedule with me? How am I going to start accepting payments? And what platform should I use to show my exercises and programming? Well, 
I like Curve Health to solve all of these issues. Curve is essentially a one-stop shop for clinicians that are trying to extend their reach beyond their traditional clinic. It has simple scheduling. You can block out times in your calendar so that clients can effortlessly sign up and have a one-on-one -on -one session with you. Curve has secure payments. Curve will handle and automate all of your payments. They also have dynamic programming. That means they have an extensive library of exercise that you can draw from for your clients. Or if you want to, you can actually take your own videos and upload that into Curve. This way, you can easily create tailored programs for each of your clients. They've also just launched a fast-growing marketplace, which is really exciting because they have people online that are looking for help, just like from folks like yourself. And through this marketplace, you can get some extra business, and these people can sign up directly with you. Honestly, Curve is the program that I wish I had as a new grad when I was in a ton of debt and was looking for ways to get a little bit extra income, and I was trying to see patients after discharge, but it was just a pain handling all the scheduling, billing, so on and so forth. If you want to learn more, check out the link in the description below. What's also pretty cool is that if you use this link, then when you sign up for the annual plan, you'll actually get 50 bucks back at you. So just for signing up for the annual plan, you make an extra 50 bucks back. In my mind, Curve is a no-brainer. Go ahead and get started. So during your subjective evaluation, what are the key points to focus in on? Right. So why don't we want to focus on the location and patterns of pain, paresthesia, sensory deficits, motor deficits. So essentially, what does the patient say when they come in to see you? Oftentimes, it may say like, wow, I just feel really weak in my shoulder. And I just have pain right over the top of the shoulder that extends down. I have a little bit of pain in my neck, but the majority of it's kind of down into my arm. Right. And automatically, we're starting to think this sounds a little bit like a cervical radiculopathy case. Right. Iyer et al. in 2016 went as far as saying that in most cases, cervical radiculopathy could be diagnosed based on the patient history alone, right? So basically, this author thought, we don't even need to do any sort of objective testing. They just tell me these symptoms and I got it, right? I know what's going on. The last piece is that these injuries can either be acute or they can be kind of chronic in nature, right? So basically, they can happen all at once. So think about a car accident, right? I've had patients that drop barbells on their neck. I've had patients that are doing handstand push-ups and they bang their head into the floor and they notice a lot of weakness and pain that radiates down the arm. I've also had patients have a very gradual onset of symptoms. They feel a little bit of kind of numbness tingling into their fingertips over the course of time, turns into some pain. Eventually, they have a ton of pain within the arm. The neck starts hurting and it's really debilitating, right? So you may find some patients, obviously, pain all at once, but the other pieces can also be gradual in nature. When patients with cervical radiculopathy describe their pain, what do they usually describe their pain as? Usually they say their pain is shooting, stabbing, or electric in nature, and usually it travels distally into the affected limb, okay? So a lot of folks will say I have this pain that kind of radiates down, shoots into my fingers, into my thumb, right? Usually travels down the arm, classic sign of cervical radiculopathy. In terms of paresthesia and numbness, the presence of paresthesia alone had an 83% sensitivity. So you have patients that come in and they say they don't have any paresthesia. It's actually a fairly sensitive test to rule out cervical radiculopathy. The combination of paresthesia and numbness had an 88% sensitivity. So no numbness, no paresthesia. It's a good chance you don't have cervical radiculopathy. And lastly, we've all heard about dermatomal patterns of pain. So essentially, patients with cervical radiculopathy should have a very, excuse me, a very predictable uh, location of pain that goes down the arm based on that dermatome level that's involved, right? So keep in mind that this is not a perfect science. So in patients that are undergoing surgery for cervical radiculopathy, only about 54% of those patients actually follow the dermatomal pattern. Okay. So we like to think that when folks have cervical radiculopathy at a given level, their pain is only going to be in a very specific location. That's only the case for around 54% of patients. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt. You also might have a patient that's dealing with multi-level cervical radiculopathy. So in the same study I was just talking about, around 13% of those patients had radiculopathy coming from multiple levels. So you may actually find folks that are going to be weak in multiple myotomes. They're going to have sensory changes in multiple dermatomes. Could just be because multiple levels are involved within their spine. So why are dermatomal patterns so bad? So this is directly coming from a researcher by the name of Bogduck. So Bogduck has done a ton of research in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical spine, uh, particularly with lumbar and cervical radiculopathy. 
right? And one of the things that he mentioned is that we've actually run these studies where we try to aggravate a given nerve and see if that provokes pain in a typical dermatomal pattern. So what happens when you end up provoking folks in their nerves? Well, for one, yes, they did report pain going down the arm. However, the pattern of cervical pain was not dermatomal. Sensory loss was, but pain wasn't. And what Bogdok wrote was, radicular pain is perceived deeply through the shoulder girdle and into the upper limb. Radicular pain from C5 tends to remain in the arm, whereas pain from C6, C7, and C8 extends into the forearm and the hand. These patterns of distribution indicate that the pain is not restricted to cutaneous afferents. It involves afferents from deep tissues as well, such as muscles and joints. Because the segmental innervation of deep tissues is not the same as that of skin, radicular pain cannot be and is not dermatomal in distribution. Basically, what he's saying is that dermatomal patterns for pain is a bunch of BS, right? So in studies where they try to provoke nerves, it doesn't create pain in dermatomal distribution. And from this basic understanding of pain, it seems that the pain does not follow the dermatomal distribution. So of course, these numbers are going to be off in these studies when they're looking at pain in a dermatomal fashion. So going back to numbness and tingling, that distribution of numbness can predict the level by dermatomal distribution, right? However, pain is going to be more nonspecific in nature, maybe C5 more likely to be in the upper arm, whereas the lower nerve roots more in the lower forearm area into the hands, right? Typically, extension and lateral flexion can be painful for these patients. So if we extend the neck and laterally flex, as well as rotate towards the involved sign, that's going to decrease the intervertebral foramen. So if there is a nerve root injury or irritation, we're probably going to provoke it with those motions. Also, keep in mind that research from Wainer et al. in 2003, the same guy that created the Wainer cluster of tests to diagnose cervical radiculopathy, he found that patients that had reduced cervical flexion, so less than 55 degrees of cervical flexion, had an increased likelihood of cervical radiculopathy. Basically, they found less than 55 degrees of flexion and an 89% sensitivity and a 41% specificity for ruling out or ruling in cervical radiculopathy. So at least in my mind, folks that have cervical radiculopathy is just irritated and all motions tend to hurt, but you may find that extension, lateral flexion, and ipsilateral uh, cervical rotation may be particularly painful just because all of those motions tend to decrease the intervertebral foraminal space. Patients with cervical radiculopathy also tend to have pain on one side. This is unique to other forms of neck pain. Essentially, if you have more mechanical neck pain, axial neck pain, usually the pain is more bilateral symmetric and more central. With cervical radiculopathy, it's usually to one side and down the arm. If you guys are liking the content so far, I'd really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to the channel. Doing this helps me make more great future content. Again, I really appreciate it. So now that you know more about cervical radiculopathy, you still need to know how to do all the special tests to rule in or rule out this condition. I have a great video for you. I'll leave a link in the corner right over there. Click on that and continue the learning. I'll see you on that next video. If you're interested in the references, I'll leave them in the description in the show notes. You can definitely check those out. Lastly, I just want to say thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. If you leave a comment, it helps the algorithm. I'd also love to know your thoughts on this presentation today. Please subscribe to the channel. It helps me out tremendously. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving me a positive review. Again, it helps tremendously. If you want to see more content like this in the future, we got to make sure we grow this over the course of time, right? And lastly, if you want to support me even further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain Free Insiders. This is going to be my premium subscription membership to Fitness Pain Free, where all my best content updated monthly uh, lives. So head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library, just $1 for a week trial. Also leave a link in the show notes in the description. All right, go ahead and check it out.